Welcome to lecture 3.2, cosets. So before we begin, I want to give you an idea visually as to what cosets are. So the regularity property of Cayley diagrams implies that identical copies of the fragment of the diagram corresponding to a subgroup appear throughout the rest of the diagram. For example, the following figures highlight the repeated copies of this subgroup generated by F in D3. So here is the subgroup in the Cayley diagram. And notice how there are identical copies of this subgroup in different parts of the diagram. Now, only one of these copies is actually a group, namely this one, because it contains the identity. These other two copies don't contain the identity, so they can't be groups. So the key concept in this lecture is that the elements that form these repeated copies of the subgroup fragment in the Cayley diagram, meaning this set and this set, and also this one as well, are called cosets. Let's do another example. So let's find all of the cosets of the following subgroup of D4. So this is a subgroup generated by F and R squared, namely these four elements. So if we use R squared as a generator in the Cayley diagram of D4, and we don't need it, but let's throw it in as well, then it will be easier to visually see the cosets. And here we go. So D4 is generated by these two elements, as we know, but just for fun, we're going to throw in R squared as well. So we've got to give this a new type of arrow. Let's say a green arrow, so R squared, and that's, of course, a double arrow because this has order 2. So R squared gets you back to the identity. So now the cosets of this subgroup are the following. Well, here's the original subgroup, this size 4 set, and then the identical copy is this size 4 set right here. So here's a formal definition. If H is a subgroup of G, then a left coset is a set of the following form. So we denote it as a fixed element, A in G, times the subgroup, and that is the set of all products of that fixed element times something in the subgroup. So the distinguished element, in this case A, that we choose to use to name the coset, is called the representative. Now, a remark is, in a Cayley diagram, the left coset, AH, can be found as follows. So, you start from the node A, and then follow all paths in H. So, we'll do an example. So, consider the subgroup generated by F in D3. So, the coset containing these two elements is the following. So, it is the set RH... In other words, R times this subgroup, or R times this subgroup, here written as a set, is just this set right here. So it's R times E and R times F. R, E, and R, F. Now, alternatively, we could have written R, F times H to denote the same coset. Because notice, R, F times H is just R, F times this set, which is the same thing. It's RF times E and RF times F, which is RF squared. F squared is the identity. So that's just the same thing as we got up here. So here's the picture. The subgroup H is this right here, and this is the identical copy that is the coset RH or equivalently, the coset RFH. So in this slide, I'm going to list a series of short results. These should be visually clear from the Cayley diagrams and the regularity property. Now, formal algebraic proofs that are not done here will be assigned as homework. So first of all, for any subgroup H of G, the union of the left cosets of H is the whole group G. And I should mention now that I'm saying left cosets because we will also define a notion of a right coset, which is analogous, but they, in some cases, will be different. So here's a proof. Now let's think about what we want to show. We want to show that every element in the group G lies in some left coset. So let's take an element, little g. Well, that clearly lies in the coset GH. Well, why? 
because g is just g times the identity, which is in this set because the identity is in h. So g times the identity is in this set, i.e. in this coset. Okay, so here's the next result. Each left coset can have multiple representatives. Well, we saw that on the previous slide, but this actually says more. This says if we take any element b in the left coset ah, then ah and bh are actually the same coset. The last proposition is that all left cosets of the same fixed subgroup have the same size. That's one of the ones that should be visually clear from the Cayley diagrams of cosets being those identical copies. Here's the next proposition. For any subgroup H of G, the left cosets of H partition the group G. Now let's think about why this is the case. Well, we know that the left cosets cover the group. In other words, everything is in some left coset. We also know that the cosets are going to be disjoint. Well, at least we have that visual picture that they should be. So let's prove it formally. So again, we know that the element g, for any fixed little g, lies in some left coset, well, namely this left coset, gh. Uniqueness follows because if g is in some other coset, then by a previous result we just did, that's actually the same coset. So there's no way that g can be in two different cosets. Now subgroups also have right cosets. We can define the following. HA is the set of all elements that are products of something in H times A. Okay, so let's do the same example as we did a couple slides ago, except let's use right cosets instead of left cosets. So let's take the subgroup generated by F in D3. Now this is a coset. It's E times H, or just H. Here's another coset, right coset. H times R is just this subgroup times R, which is this set of two elements times R. And by that, I really mean R and FR, because again, E times R is R, and F times R is FR. And I prefer to write FR as R squared F. Remember this relation. Now, the last coset is h times r squared, which is this size 2 set times r squared, which is e r squared, there it is, and f r squared, which is that, which I prefer to write like this. So notice that h, so this, this is the uh, subgroup of e and f, along with this coset and that coset, partitions the group. Now in this example, the left cosets for this subgroup are different than the right cosets. Now if you forget, the left cosets are RH, which is R times E and F, which is R and RF, and the other left coset is r squared h, which I'm just going to write it here, is r squared and r squared f. And notice that these two subsets are different than these two subsets. So here's r and r squared f in the same right coset, but they're in different left cosets. So because of that, they must look different in the Cayley diagram somehow. So that's what we'll look at next. The left diagram below shows the left coset. I'm going to call this RH because this, this is big H for that subgroup in D3. So it's these two nodes. And notice that these are the nodes that, well, I'm going to call the blue arrows F arrows because they correspond to the element F. So these are the nodes that the F arrows can reach after the path to R has been followed. So in other words, start with the identity, apply the element R, and then 
apply all the arrows of elements in the subgroup, in which case just F arrows. So start here, do R, and then apply all of the F arrows. Now the right diagram right here shows the right coset H, R, and D3. That is the nodes that R arrows can reach from the elements in the subgroup H. So here, if we're reading left to right, we first start at the identity, follow all of the F arrows, that traces out this subgroup, in other words, these two nodes, and then after we do that, then we apply R. So from here, if we apply R, we get there, and from there, we get to that node. Thus, left cosets look like copies of the subgroup, while the elements of right cosets are usually scattered. And the only reason for this, it's, it's partially artificial, is because we adopted the convention that arrows in a Cayley diagram represent right multiplication as opposed to left multiplication. So a key point from here, something that I want you to take away, is that left and right cosets are generally different. Not always, but you should suspect that they don't need to be the same. So let's continue with this. Now for any subgroup H of G, we can think of G as the union of non-overlapping and equal-sized copies of that subgroup. Well, I said any subgroup. Maybe I should have said of that subgroup. Um, so those equal-sized copies are that subgroup's left cosets. Though the right cosets also partition the group, the corresponding partitions could be different. Here are a few visualizations of this idea. So on the left we have a group, these are just cartoons, but here's a subgroup H and here are the identical copies of the subgroup, which are the cosets. Now these next two pictures um, really illustrate the idea of left and right cosets being different. So here's a subgroup H and maybe let's say that the left cosets look like stacks so they are a partition of the group, but the right cosets might be different. Now some of them are going to be the same, or some, well, H and H, both of these are left and right cosets, those have to be the same. But for the other cosets, let's say maybe this left coset is equal to this right coset, but in general, maybe this coset, left coset G2H, might be different than this right coset. So here's a definition that we will need uh, throughout the rest of the course. For any subgroup of G, the index of that subgroup in G, and we write that like, like this, the index of G, I'm sorry, the index of H in G, well, I guess we say it from right to left, is the number of distinct cosets of H and G. And I don't care, left or right, it's the same number. So here's a picture of this for the group D3. Now remember that we determined that the left and right cosets are different, or at least two out of three of them are different. So here is a picture of the left cosets, and here is a picture of the right cosets. Now if we take a different subgroup, let's take the subgroup generated by R, so that's these three elements, then the left and right cosets are the same. And notice that we don't actually have any choice of this. It's because this subgroup takes up half of the group, well, everything that's left over is the other coset. In this case, it's a left coset, F times N. And in this case, think of it as a right coset, N times F. So this is a small little result that we can prove just by writing down that argument. I will let you do that as an exercise. So if we have a subgroup, that has index 2, that just means there's two cosets, then the left and the right cosets are the same. And again, that just follows from the fact that there's only two cosets, they're the same size, they partition the group, and we know that at least one of them has to be the same in terms of the left coset and the right coset. So that forces the other one to be the same as well. Okay, so let's look at a special case of abelian groups. Recall that in some abelian groups, we use the symbol uh, plus for the binary operation. In this case, left cosets um, have the form A plus H. 
So we don't actually write it a times h, we write it a plus h. For example, let's let g be the subgroup of the integers and consider the subgroup h, which, well, here I'm going to write this as 4h, because by this I actually mean the set of all products of 4 times h. So this is a, a subgroup. So it's the set of all multiples of 4. The left cosets of this subgroup are the following. So obviously h is a coset, but then 1 plus h is a set of all integers that are equivalent to 1 mod 4. 2 plus h is the integers that are equivalent to 2 mod 4. And 3 plus h are those that are equivalent to 3 mod 4. So clearly, these things partition the integers. In other words, every integer is in exactly one of these cosets. Notice that these are the same as the right cosets of h, namely these four sets. In other words, if I add 1, 2, 3, and, and 0 to the right versus the left, that doesn't change anything. Now, more generally, do you see why the left and right cosets of an abelian group will always be the same? Well, let me sketch it out. So, A plus H is the set of all elements. A plus H, where H ranges in the subgroup. And since this is abelian, I can write this as H plus A, where H ranges throughout the subgroup. And that's just h plus a. So again, the left coset equals the right coset. And this doesn't have to be just for this h. This can be for any subgroup of an abelian group. And finally, I want to point out why it would be incorrect to write 3h for the coset 3 plus h. So in fact, if I had written 3h, that would probably be interpreted to be the subgroup 12z. So in other words, if this is h, the multiples of 4, and I had written 3 times, put a 3 in front of there, then that suggests that I'm multiplying all of these elements by 3, and then I get multiples of 4, which is another subgroup, but namely it's the subgroup 12z. So we will finish this lecture with one of our first major theorems, which is named after the prolific 18th century Italian and French mathematician, Joseph Lagrange. So Lagrange's theorem says that if G is a finite group and H is a subgroup, then the order of H divides the order of G. So notice that this doesn't make much sense, or it's kind of meaningless, if G is infinite, hence the restriction. So let's prove this. So let's suppose there are n left cosets of the subgroup H. Since they are all of the same size and they partition G, then it must be the case that the order of G is equal to the sum of the orders of each of the cosets. In other words, n times the, the size of a coset, which is the size of H. Well, therefore, the order of H divides the order of g. Well, why? Because the order of h times an integer is equal to the order of g. That's what it means to divide. And that's the end of the proof. So one corollary to this, is if g is a finite group and h is a subgroup, then the index of h and g is just the order of h divided by the order of g.